Throughout 2023, we invested quality time together exploring the rich treasury of spiritual truths in the Epistle to the Philippians. Today, as we've been reminded already, is the first Sunday of 2024, and so we're going to begin a new series of expository Bible ministry in the Old Testament as we turn our attention this morning to the first chapter of First Samuel. One of the people in a church I visited a while ago said to me he didn't believe that we should be spending any time at all in the Old Testament because it's not relevant to us today and we should only focus on the New Testament. Let me be very, very clear here. We make no apology for turning to the Old Testament. And this, in fact, is a fascinating section of God's Holy Word because it includes a number of situations where God's power, God's plan, and God's purpose for his people are clearly evident in the lives of individuals and also, as it happens, the entire nation. Its relevance to us today is unmistakably obvious, and that in itself is an excellent reason why we do well to consider it carefully rather than casually. The entire Bible, the entire Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, is the divinely inspired, infallible word of the living God inerrant in the original autographs. The Bible does not contain the Word of God. The Bible is the Word of God. Within the Bible is everything we need to know for what we are to believe and how we are to behave. And the Bible is the final authority for every Christian in all matters of faith and practice. What is it then that makes First Samuel so important that we should invest time on Sunday mornings expounding its content and the truths contained within it? Great question. Israel is very much in the news these days and First Samuel records the transition where Israel goes from the rule of God their invisible king, who made them different and unique from the nations of the world, to the rule of man, a visible king, which made them just like all the other nations. The book, 1 Samuel, covers a period of 115 years from the birth of Samuel throughout the very turbulent times of Saul to the beginning of David, the king, chosen by God. And the life of Samuel is actually a wonderful study of prayer as we see his intercession for Israel. We see him walking intimately with God. Samuel was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. God's people go from a theocracy to a monarchy. Think about it now. For decades, a long, long period of time, Israel has heard nothing from God. During those decades, the priests of Israel have become corrupt. They're only concerned with their own wealth and their immoral lifestyles. Tragically, even Eli, the high priest and the judge of Israel, has failed to faithfully serve God and his people. The nation is slowly and steadily sliding into spiritual declension. And as it does so, the enemies of Israel in the surrounding nations begin to threaten the safety and the security of Israel and its citizens. Does that sound familiar? Not only that, something really important was missing. The Israelites had lost the Ark of the Covenant to the Philistines. The Ark of the Covenant was the symbol of God's presence in their midst. The Philistines understood this. 
Something serious and something significant needs to happen in Israel. What is it? I'll tell you what it is. Israel needs to hear from God again. So with your Bible open at 1 Samuel and chapter 1, please look very carefully with me at these opening words of this very important passage in God's holy word. Hear the word of the Lord. Now there was a man. Now if you happen to be using the King James or authorized version of the Bible, you will have noticed that verse 1 specifies a certain man, not just any man. From Ramathim Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of the armies in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. The great biblical preacher and expositor Charles Haddon Spurgeon writes about this chapter and he says, quote, on how small an incident the greatest results may hinge. It is most important for us to learn that the smallest trifles are arranged by the God of providence as the most startling events. He who counts the stars has also numbered the hairs on our heads. Our lives and deaths are predestined, but so also are our sitting down and our rising up. Had we but sufficiently powerful perceptive faculties, we would see God's hand as clearly in each stone of our pathway as in the revolution of the earth. And in watching our own, own lives, we would plainly see that on many occasions, the smallest grain has turned the scale. So it's in this moral cesspool of society that God's Holy Spirit introduces us to a family. And in particular, introduces us to a godly woman, Hannah. Things were very definitely bad in Israel. But not everyone was bad because God was moving mightily in the lives of these people who were fully committed to him as he still does today. Now, obviously, I cannot continue further without addressing this matter of Elkanah having two wives. Today, that's referred to as polygamy. In fact, several of you have already asked me about this or mentioned it to me. So let's be very, very clear about this. While most people today regard polygamy, meaning having more than one wife as immoral, there is, are you listening carefully, actually nowhere in the Bible that it is explicitly condemned. But at the same time, the Bible does not say why God allowed it. In fact, if you do a study on this, you'll find that at least 16 men are recorded in the Old Testament who had more than one wife. But interestingly also, there were numerous problems that arose because of that fact. What's even more fascinating is that in one particular instance, having more than one wife was made mandatory. It was a requirement. So when was that, John? That was when a married man died without leaving a male heir. And in this case, the man's brother was required to marry his widow, regardless of whether or not he already had a wife. And the reason for this is so that she would have support during her later years, and also so that the family name would be passed on. 
There was only one firm restriction to this, and that's recorded in Leviticus 18.18. 18. While your wife is living, do not marry her sister and have sexual relations with her, for they would be rivals. Now you've probably heard it said more than once that God's plan for marriage is one man and one woman for one lifetime. I believe that firmly. And the Bible tells us that this was established by God from the very beginning. Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 through 24. The Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place, and the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. Then the man said, At last! This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. That's the Old Testament record. In the New Testament, Jesus spoke and commented on this. He said in Matthew 19, 6, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no person is to separate. If you're married this morning, or expect to be married at some point in the future, that almost certainly will be quoted during the wedding ceremony. Let's be very clear about this, unambiguous and specific. The Bible does teach that marriage is between a man and a woman. Marriage is not between a woman and a woman. Marriage is not between a man and a man or between a human being created in the image of God and an animal or some inanimate object as many are now claiming. We live in a society that does not wish to recognize or be conformed to God's holy law. And the fact that the sinful society of this world strongly promotes immoral, same-sex relationships and calls them marriage does not make them marriage in the eyes of God. You can call a pig a golden retriever, but that doesn't alter the fact that it's still a pig. God has made it very clear in his holy word that those who engage in those activities are already under divine judgment. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. Though they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and darkened in their foolish hearts. And listen, they exclaimed, exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images of mortal man, birds, animals, and reptiles, and therefore God gave them over to the desires of their hearts to impurity for dishonoring their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is forever worthy of praise. Amen. For this reason, God gave them over to dishonorable passions. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. Likewise, the men abandoned natural relations with women and burned with lust one for another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Why do you think Many have suffered with AIDS and other afflictions. These are not my words. These are God's words clearly stated in his word, the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor those drunk, nor verbal abusers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. 
writing to the believers in Corinth, Paul continues and says, such was some of you, but there was a change. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And that's what needs to happen to everyone who practices those things that have been listed in God's word this morning. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8 says the cowardly and unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What's even worse, I believe, is that where there's a genuine marriage, Divorce now is regarded as an easy way out to exit the marriage and move on to another partner without any regard at all to what God has to say about it or the eternal consequences resulting from it. We do well to carefully consider the matter in the light of the divinely inspired, infallible word of the one true living God. It could not be clearer or plainer than that. God's plan for marriage is one man and one woman for one lifetime. But it would be remiss of me if I stopped there and did not also reference the other Bible verses which contain further teaching by the Lord Jesus Christ on the matter. For example, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32. I say to you, are you listening? This is important. Whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman, commits adultery. Now, a lot of people have jumped on what's known as the exception clause there in these verses, and they've used it as a justification for their own actions. But Jesus provided additional teaching on the matter. In Mark chapter 10, verses 10 through 12, in the house the disciples began questioning him about this. They were concerned about what he'd already told them. And he said to them, whoever, are you listening, divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. The Apostle Paul provided further clarification on the matter, as evidently it was a continuing concern for many people in the early church. In Romans 7, verses 2 through 3, the married woman, are you listening, is bound by law to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law concerning the husband. So that if while her husband is alive, she gives herself to another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law, so she's not an adulteress if she gives herself to another man. These passages clearly and unambiguously reveal God's law regarding marriage one man and one woman for one lifetime. That means, inevitably, that if a man marries a woman who has been divorced, they are both guilty of adultery. If a man divorces his wife, he's guilty of causing her to commit adultery. Now, this may not be what some people want to hear, but it is the truth of God's holy word and the requirement on me incumbent as a pastor of God's holy word and an expositor of the truth of his word is to state clearly what his word teaches without apology. Now turn your attention with me to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Now there was a certain man from Ramathim Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim. His name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, the other Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of armies in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to the Lord there. Elkanah, interestingly, was a Levite by birth, but an Ephraimite by residence. The name Elkanah means God possessed, or God possesses, or God has created. Elkanah was clearly 
a God-fearing man. We know that because the scripture here clearly states that he was a man who was faithful in his annual pilgrimage to Shiloh to offer sacrifices to the Lord his God. And Peninnah, one of his wives, had borne children to Elkanah, but Hannah was barren. And as in most polygamous marriages, there was rivalry between the two women. It's almost inevitable. And despite the fact that in those days a, a wife's value was tied to her childbearing abilities, Elkanah actually loved Hannah very much. And for her, he was deeply grieved about the sadness she knew and the rivalry that was taking place between those two women. Peninnah taunted Hannah about her child, childlessness year after year until Hannah could take it no more. We just recently celebrated the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as a baby born in Bethlehem. The birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, his life, his death, resurrection and ascension are God's provision and solution to the sinful problems of lost mankind. It's interesting, isn't it, that throughout history God often solved problems by sending a baby. Babies are God's announcement that he knows the need, that he cares about his people, and he's at work on their behalf. Because a baby ushers in a new life, a new beginning. Babies are like signposts, if you like, to the future. Their conception and their birth is a miracle that only God can accomplish. And to make the event seem even greater, God sometimes selects barren women to be the mothers. For example, he sent Isaac to Sarah, Jacob and Esau to Rebekah, and Joseph to Rachel. And as we begin this ministry series in 1 Samuel, we clearly see that the Israelites were in terrible trouble because of one significant and important factor. They lacked godly leadership. The priesthood was defiled. There was no sustained prophetic message from the Lord, and the law of Moses, God's law, was being ignored throughout the land. God can do his work by himself. God can work through angels or by any other number of means, but his normal method is to find a certain man and work through him. And at this strategic time and place, God began his plan, as he almost always does, with a person he will use. More to the point, he would sometimes find a certain woman and work through her to bring about his sovereign plan. There are several important things, I think, that become very clear about this man, Elkanah, and from which we can learn. And the first thing to which I want to draw your attention is the fact that Elkanah's home was not the perfect family setting that we might assume. There were very serious relationship issues in the family, and obviously, in particular, between the two women. But before you begin to think, well, that wouldn't be unusual, why are you taking the time to bring it to our attention this morning, let me share the reason. Very often, when there are problems within families, it results in the families neglecting their spiritual responsibilities and failing to attend worship regularly. And what I believe is quite striking here is that with the full knowledge of the strife between the two women, Elkanah was determined not to allow that to distract him or deter him from his spiritual responsibilities in worship. Despite the fact that everything wasn't quite perfect in the family at home, he maintained his faithful and regular attendance at God's altar. Investing time in prayer is never wasted time. It's been wisely stated that prayer does not make God see things as we see them. 
it helps us see things as God sees them. And as we invest time in his presence, the light of his glory shines brightly and provides us with illumination and clarification on our circumstances and our situations. In fact, the words of the psalmist David recorded in Psalm 36 verse 9 are stunningly relevant right now. 36 verse 9, the fountain of life is with you. Are you listening? In your light we see light. Are you having some difficulty in discovering and determining God's plan and purpose for your life? Are you struggling with a particular personal problem that's troubling you constantly? <laughs> Elkanah was fully aware of the tensions between these two women and the taunting of Hannah by Penina over her lack of ability to bear children. But what we don't find here, very interestingly, is Elkanah attempting to resolve this situation by discussion and reasoning with Penina. I believe he demonstrated genuine wisdom by preferring instead to make it a matter of serious prayer before the throne of God. A truly godly man, he presented the situation to the Lord and genuinely believed that God would answer his prayers in his time. As we move further into this chapter and the fascinating account of God's dealings with his people in coming weeks, we're all going to notice inevitably that it's the faithfulness of Elkanah in his commitment to regular worship and prayer that does eventually bear fruit in the life of Hannah. Despite the taunting of Penina, isn't it interesting to notice that Hannah also faithfully attends worship and is equally serious in her prayers to God. Elkanah is sensitive to Hannah's disappointments. He's kind and gracious in meeting her needs. There's another thing about this situation to which I wish to draw your attention. By faithfully attending worship and prayers at Shiloh, Elkanah shows us that he was not allowing the terrible sins of Hophni and Phinehas, who were serving as the officiating priests or leaders at the sanctuary of Shiloh at the time of Hannah to deter him or provide him with an excuse for not being faithful in his attendance and worship. There are many today who make the leadership in local churches the reason they won't attend for worship and prayer. Elkanah didn't do that. There's no doubt that Hophni and Phinehas were wicked men. None at all. The lives they were living publicly and shamelessly were clear evidence of that. But that did not stop Elkanah from doing what God's word commanded him to do. He was a faithful man. Hophni and Phinehas were the two sons of Eli the priest. And according to the historian Josephus, Phinehas officiated as the high priest because Eli resigned because of his advanced age. Scripture is so clear in, a, in what I would say a damning way in its devastating statement and description of these men. 1 Samuel 2.12 says, Are you listening? The sons of Eli were useless men. But it goes on. They did not know the Lord. Here we see men serving in positions of leadership with spiritual authority, and yet they were men, Scripture clearly says, who did not know God. The Lord willing, in future weeks, we'll be looking at this matter in rather more detail than we can on this occasion this morning. But for now, we simply need to know that because Eli's sons did not know or regard God, they acted in wicked ways. The Bible is very specific concerning these two men. And those of you who've been regularly attending Grace Bible Church 
will know that our weekly Old Testament reading has been in the book of Leviticus. We discussed it earlier in church this morning. It's there that God's law and instructions were clearly stated and must be observed. In Leviticus we're told that Eli's sons took a three-pronged fork and ate whatever meat they brought out of the pot when sacrificing an animal in complete contradiction with the law for priests who were commanded to eat the breast and upper thigh of the animals. Again, this was brought out earlier in our service this morning. I'm frequently amazed at the way the Holy Spirit organizes and harmonizes the various aspects of our worship services to emphasize the importance of something to us. They were disobeying the clear commands of God. Secondly, Eli's two sons were sleeping with and sexually involved with the women dedicated to the service of the tabernacle. 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 22, Eli was very old. He heard about everything his sons were doing in Israel. He heard that they slept with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. This was directly contrary to God's law which forbids adultery. In Exodus 20 verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. There are many things here that are great causes for concern. The first thing to know is what is clearly stated in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 12, that Hophni and Phinehas didn't know the Lord. Because they didn't know the Lord, they should never have been allowed to serve as, as priests. I believe there are many who are serving in churches today who really do not know the Lord. And before you rush to accuse me of making, me, of making a value judgment here, let, let me remind you that we're known by our fruit, not by the size of the church, not by our success, not by our popularity. The focus of so much that is called ministry today is on the personalities of the people who are leading rather than on the God whom we profess to know, worship, love, and serve. The sons of Eli were useless men. They did not know the Lord. The fact that Hophni and Phinehas were sleeping and sexually involved with the women who were serving was no secret. What is so remarkable to me is that even though they were aware of this, Elkina and Hannah did not allow that to become an excuse to distract or deter them from being faithful personally in their worship of Almighty God and their personal prayer life. It's been said that comparisons are odious and sometimes, however, they can be exceptionally helpful. As you think about Elkanah and Hannah and the way they handle the serious challenges in their lives, how does that compare to the way you are dealing with the particular challenges and the difficulties in your life. Have you learned anything? Is anything needing to be changed? Here's the truth. There was only one perfect man who walked the soil of this earth and we crucified him. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The glorious truth of the Savior who was born in Bethlehem, who lived a perfect life and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, is that the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. By truly repenting of our sin and placing our full faith and trust in his atoning work on the cross on our behalf, Unlike Hophni and Phinehas, who did not know the Lord, we may come to know him personally as our Savior and our Lord. The Apostle Paul expressed the deepest desire of his heart in Philippians 3.10. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. The world we live in today does not know him. 1 Corinthians 1.21 For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God 
was well pleased, are you listening, through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. So the most important question is, do you know him? Do you believe in him? Acts chapter 16 and verse 31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved.